I'm very happy to be able to welcome you all to the 2022 UCL Centre for Law and the Environment annual lecture. Um, a warm welcome, I hope, to the people online. Um, Stephen Vaughan's going to be fielding questions at the end, so stay with us and he'll take your questions if you're online. And I'm really delighted to see everybody in the room. I wonder when we'll stop being so excited to see a group of people together in, in a room. I hope never. I hope it's always this exciting. Um, so I'm Maria Lee and I've been one of the co-directors of the centre for many years now. The centre is the faculty's home for legal research, teaching and scholarship in the field of the environment. And we're really delighted to have Nadine Elanani with us today. Nadine is reader in law at Birkbeck School of Law, where she's also co-director of the Centre for Research on Race and Law. Her very important book, Bordering Britain, Law, Race and Empire, was published in February 2020. In that book, she places migration and asylum within the history of empire and race. And she shows how colonialism shaped and continues to shape our world and indeed our law. She's also recently co-edited a wonderful collection after Grenfell, Violence, Resistance, Response. In 2020, Nadine was awarded a prestigious Philip Leverhulme Prize for her work on law, race and the environment. And tonight, I believe, is the first outing for that work, so that's wonderful. We couldn't have a more exciting um, or a more timely lecture this year. And with that, I will hand over to Nadine for her lecture on race, law and the air we breathe. Thank you so much, um, Maria, for that introduction and also for the invitation um, to, to give this lecture. Um, it's a real honour and a real pleasure and privilege to be here and to be here in the room with all of you. And I'm so grateful to you all for coming, and those here in the room and also um, people attending online and those watching in the future, because um, I understand that this is uh, being recorded as well. So... Um, Yes, I'm going to talk um, today about uh, my research on uh, race, law, and the environment, um, but focusing specifically today um, on air pollution. Um, so a few years ago, I spent time talking to the families of racialized death in custody victims about their experiences of grief and how it might be affected by racism as a causal factor in the death of their loved ones. Custody deaths, of course, um, uh, deaths in police custody, are at the sharp end of what we understand to be racial state violence. The stories we hear and often see captured in film, in video footage, that involve police shootings of unarmed black people bring home the reality um, that racialized people are disproportionately at risk of the most brutal forms of state violence as they move through white spaces. In Britain, inquest juries have yielded what are now called conclusions and what were called verdicts until recently of unlawful killing in 12 death in custody cases. But even in these cases, the officers involved have not been held criminally responsible. So in this work that I've done on deaths in custody, the question I ask is what... What does it mean for justice and strategies towards justice when racial state violence seems to be illegible to the legal system that also produces that violence? As I was saying, custodial deaths are at the sharp end of this kind of violence. Even in cases which involve these extreme levels of police brutality, of racial abuse that's caught on film and, and is available for public viewing, they don't yield the kind of justice and accountability outcomes that we might expect from the law in a traditional sense, like a criminal conviction, for example, of an officer involved. So if the law can't account for these kinds of deaths, then the question I've also asked myself recently is how can it be relied on in instances where that racial state violence is even harder to detect, so where it's even less visible. So there are a number of intersections between this topic that I've started out talking about, deaths in custody, 
um, and that of environmental harm or um, injury, and heart, injury and death caused by environmental harm. There's a connection um, to, to the way in which I've described um, the problem for law uh, in dealing with custodial deaths. So today I'm going to focus on the limitations of law in addressing violence, whether it's sudden, of the kind that I've described, or a slow, slow form of violence, which has its roots and structural causes. And if we think about climate change, if we think about the climate catastrophe and its racialized effects, we can see these as no less of a brutal form of racial state violence as racialized police killings. That's the argument that I'm going to make. But it's more difficult to identify these kinds of um, harms or these kinds of deaths as um, racial state violence. It's much easier to identify the sudden violent spectacle as that. But it's still a kind of violence that affects people who live at the edge in borderlands, in marginalized parts of urban landscapes. So I'm going to concentrate today on one instance of slow violence, that of the introduction of poisonous substances into the air that we breathe. If the effects of air pollution are racialized, then the state's sanctioning of air pollution and its failure to act to limit its fatal consequences amounts to racial state violence. In this context, I'm going to explore the challenges for one family, one family justice campaign for a racialized victim of air pollution in light of the law's role in producing and sustaining racial state violence. The taking of breath is the taking of life. Eric Garner's last words as he was restrained by police officers in New York City in 2014 were, I can't breathe. In 2010, Jimmy Mubenga's final words as he was restrained by G4S guards contracted by the Home Office to deport him to Angola were, I can't breathe. This is Ella Kissy Deborah. She also couldn't breathe. She was, nine, she was nine years old when she died following an asthma attack in February 2013. She lived in London, in Lewisham, 25 meters from the South Circular Road. Before she died, she had suffered three years of seizures brought on by asthma attacks, which resulted in 27 visits to hospital. More research is needed to understand the link between asthma and social deprivation. But it is known that asthma is caused by a number of factors, including those that are genetic and environmental. Its symptoms are triggered by various behavioral and environmental factors. Long-term exposure to high concentrations of air pollution is a cause of asthma among children and adults. Babies who are exposed to high levels of air pollution at the prenatal stage are at higher risk of developing asthma. And children who live in highly polluted areas are more likely to have reduced lung function as adults. And air pollution is a significant trigger of the symptoms of asthma. Of course, air pollution affects us all. Respiratory diseases, in particular, though, have been linked to social deprivation. The racialized effects of air pollution are stark when looked at in global terms. In 2018, the World Health Organization reported that 93% of people under the age of 15 across the world are breathing unsafe levels of pollutants on a daily basis. Racialized nations in the global south are disproportionately affected. Health inequalities are defined as the preventable differences in health outcomes between groups when separated by factors such as geography, socioeconomic status, or race. And this is the issue that I want to draw attention to with this work. Despite the government's legal obligations under the National Health Service Act of 2006 and the Health and Social Care Act of 2012 to reduce health inequalities, they're on the rise. According to the British Lung Foundation, in 2012, incidence rates of asthma were 36% higher in the most deprived communities than that in the least deprived. And this, this trend is on the increase. 50% of people of African descent live in poverty, and overall, two-fifths of ethnic minorities live in a household earning below average income. There are markedly higher rates of asthma among the racialized poor living in England and Wales. Racialized people born in Britain have a higher incidence of asthma than racialized people living in Britain but born elsewhere. So research suggests that children of racialized migrants 
are particularly at risk of experiencing high rates of asthma incidence. And this is really telling because it tells us something about the conditions in which the, ra the, ra in which the racialized poor live in Britain, conditions which make them vulnerable to harm and premature death. Ruth Wilson Gilmore describes racism as the state-sanctioned and or extra-legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. This is a helpful definition of racism because it's a structural definition. Dean Spain has observed how Gilmore's definition of racism helps us to understand how systems of meaning and control, such as law, distribute chances at life and death. Gilmore highlights the importance of recognizing that racism is structurally produced. This is a particular help when applied to the legal field because it allows us to depart from the traditional discrimination law framework that requires us to locate a particular individual who can be shown to have intentionally discriminated against another individual on the basis of a protected characteristic such as race. Instead, we can alter the focus, drawing attention to how harmful conditions are experienced across populations that are targeted for abandonment by the state. So in considering the reasons for the overrepresentation of racialized people among lower income households and in under-resourced spaces, we can turn, and we should turn, to Britain's imperial history. In my work on the colonial origins of British immigration law, I show how, in the course of changes to British immigration and nationality law in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, as Britain transitioned from an empire to a nation state, effectively creating itself as a post-imperial, principally white nation state, the entitlement of racialized people to enter and remain in Britain was halted. As colonial populations fought the British from their territories, British lawmakers abandoned the myth of imperial unity and equality and moved to introduce controls um, which targeted racialized colonial subjects and Commonwealth citizens. This legislation culminated in the 1981 British Nationality Act, which had the effect of conjuring Britain as a post-imperial, territorially defined and circumscribed entity. It cut Britain off from the rest of its colonies and the Commonwealth, announcing it as a notionally white and geographically distinct nation space. This was achieved through the concept of patriality, which had been invented for the purposes of the 1971 Immigration Act and it made whiteness intrinsic to British identity. Patrials were defined as people born in Britain or with a parent born in Britain, and only they had a right of abode, so a right of entry and stay in Britain. In 1971, a person born in Britain was 98% likely to be white. So we can see here the effects of the legislation, what they were intended to be. The patriality provision was drafted so as to ensure that white Australians, Canadians, and New, Zealand, New Zealanders would still retain the right to enter Britain, whilst non-white Commonwealth and colony citizens would not. So the concept of British citizenship, which was later introduced in the 1981 British Nationality Act, continued this process of racial exclusion. British citizenship was made to rest on the foundation of the 1971 Act's concept of patriality, tethering it to the right of entry and abode. This had significant material and symbolic consequences. Britain was to be considered spatially distinct and now had a concept of citizenship that made Britishness commensurate with whiteness. Not only were non-white colony and Commonwealth citizens to be prevented from entering and residing in Britain, but the presence of those already in Britain was questioned through institutionalized practices of racial control and exclusion. This didn't only happen at the external borders, but also internally, with racialized people being confined to spaces of extreme deprivation, predominantly in the inner cities. These spaces and their residents were brutally policed, with officers performing the role of enforcing Britain's white nationalist borders. Contemporary racial state violence, whether in the form of racialized deaths in custody or disproportionate exposure to air pollution and corresponding vulnerability to ill health and premature death, must therefore be understood as latent expressions of empire. <clears throat> 
Shireen Razak, in her work on state sponsorship of spatially unjust zones in Canadian cities, writes that the presence of the racial other in white spaces gives rise to a careful management of boundaries within the urban space. Razak has shown how the effect of the transition from the colonial era and urbanization policies of segregation in the 1950s and 60s was to replicate colonially, colonial spatial zones whereby slum administration replaces colonial administration. These practices are recognizable also in a post-imperial Britain. Colonial subjects and Commonwealth citizens who came to Britain in the 1950s and 60s were denied help by the British government. Ministers refused to introduce legislation making racial discrimination illegal. The Cabinet Committee on Commonwealth Immigration feared that providing housing and other support and advice services to new arrivals would encourage more racialized people to travel to Britain. This is the reason that the committee refused to provide the necessary funds to housing trusts to improve accommodation problems in places such as Notting Hill, a stone's throw away from where Grenfell Tower was to be built a decade later as part of a slum clearing operation. The Grenfell Tower fire of the 14th of June 2017 is a terrifying example of how the confinement of the racialized poor to dangerous and under-resourced buildings makes them acutely vulnerable to harm and premature death. Spatially unjust zones are produced and maintained through processes of deregulation and have the effect of legitimizing and depoliticizing the disastrous consequences for racialized people. Similarly, the racialized poor are at greater risk of exposure to air pollution, in part because they are more likely to live in zones in the city where emissions are particularly high. Some of you may find that, um, uh, may remember this, um, statistic that was circulated quite a lot in the wake of the Grenfell Tower fire. Most children who live above the fourth floor of tower blocks in England are black or Asian. And I had the chance to ask Danny Dorling actually, you know, wh why is that? And, you know, what was the historical reason for, for that being the case today? And he said that um, in his understanding, there was a policy among local councils when allocating social housing, not to allocate housing above the fourth floor to parents with with young children because of problems of accessibility and prams, etc. But that when um, racialized Commonwealth and colony citizens began to arrive in the 50s and 60s, this policy wasn't applied to them. And so this is how um, they began to be, um, that this statistic kind of, kind of took shape. So you could already see there this, this process in which this selective application of what is a, a sensible um, policy um, its selective application led to people being disproportionately at risk of, of, of the harm um, uh, that, that, that people tragically came to in, in, in 2017. So Rosenblatt and Wallace have shown how in the US context, racism leads di directly or indirectly to greater poverty or a less healthful environment, poorer health, fewer doctor visits, poorer pregnancy care, poorer nutrition and poorer access to health care. Along with racism that occurs in medical institutions and industrial environments, they demonstrate that direct experiences of racism and such indirect effects of racism as housing deficiencies, lack of jobs, poverty, may so stress the cardiovascular system, the immune system, and other bodily systems as to jeopardize health. Toxic waste dumps and chemical plants that emit hazardous chemicals into the air and the water table are located in places where a relatively high percentage of the people living in nearby danger zones are African American. So like the vulnerability that flows from being in police detention and the inability to escape targeted abuse, the racialized poor find themselves disproportionately trapped in parts of the city where the air they breathe makes them vulnerable to harm and premature death. Unlike people from high income households, they don't have access to the financial resources, which makes it possible to retreat to parts of the city where the air is cleaner. So what caused Ella Kissy Deborah's death? Article two of the European Convention on Human Rights protects the right to life. It places both positive and negative obligations on states. They must not intentionally take life and must take positive measures to protect life. Article two also requires that where a state has failed to take reasonable steps to protect life, 
such deaths must be investigated. So in the UK, an Article 2 inquest takes place in circumstances where it's arguable that the state has breached its convention obligation to protect the right to life. So there was an inquest into Ella Kissy Deborah's death at Southwark Coroner's Court in 2014. And it concluded that her death was caused by acute respiratory failure, a severe asthma attack followed by a seizure possibly caused by an allergic reaction to something in the air. However, the exact cause of death was not identified. After a lengthy campaign, Ella's mother, Rosamond Kissy Deborah, was granted a new inquest by the High Court. The Attorney General was persuaded to quash the previous inquest findings after being presented with new evidence which linked Ella's death with spikes in air pollution near her home in Lewisham, South London. In the High Court, Judge Mark Lucroft, KC, stated that, in our judgment, the discovery of new evidence makes it necessary in the interests of justice that a fresh inquest be held. Professor Stephen Holgate, an expert in asthma and air pollution, was commissioned to write a report into Ella's death by her mother. He found a striking association between the times Ella was admitted to hospital and recorded spikes in nitrogen dioxide and PM10s, the most noxious pollutants near her home. He stated that there was a real prospect that without unlawful levels of air pollution, Ella would not have died. Holgate also considered that Ella's death certificate should be amended to reflect the fact that air pollution was a contributory factor in her death. In the past, the government was found to be in breach of its obligations under European Union law to reduce the public's exposure to air pollution and putting in place plans to reduce air pollution. Ella's mother, Rosamond Kissy Deborah, argued that the government's failure to act to reduce air pollution from diesel traffic was a breach of her daughter's right to life under Article 2 of the ECHR. Ella's mother hoped that, in that at the time that a new inquest would make those in power realise that our children are dying as a result of the air they breathe. In December 2020, the new inquest took place. The coroner found that Ella Kissy Deborah was her death was caused by acute respiratory failure, severe asthma, and air pollution exposure. He said she was exposed to nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter, pollution in excess of World Health Organization guidelines, the main source of which are traffic emissions. He considered that the failure to reduce pollution levels to legal limits possibly contributed to Ella's death as did the failure to provide her mother with information about the potential for air pollution to exacerbate asthma. But what the new inquest did not address is the question of whether Ella's racialization made her particularly vulnerable to the fatal effects of air pollution. And I want to make clear here that I'm in no way questioning the strategy adopted by Rosamond Kissy Deborah. There is no doubt that a new inquest finding that air pollution contributed to the cause of Ella's death has provided the clarity Ella's family needs. It's drawn attention to the consequences of breaches in air pollution regulations, and it's rightly implicated the government in her death. As Rosamond Kissy Deborah has said, this is the first time that air pollution has ever been cited on a UK death certificate. She has also said that Ella deserves to have the real cause of her death on her death certificate to reflect all that suffering, the intensive care, the tubes, the fear, and to show the government that they have to act. While the new inquest has found that air pollution was a contributory cause of Ella's death, it's unlikely to lead to the sort of outcomes that would be required to reduce health inequalities. Rosamond Kissy Deborah has said that Ella always wanted to know what was making her so ill. She asked all of the many doctors who treated her, but it was a mystery for so long. A new inquest has told her mother that air pollution, and by implication, the government's failure to do anything about it was what was making Ella ill. What it hasn't told her, and what it can't tell us, is that race and class as structures of oppression and exclusion are what made Ella particularly and disproportionately vulnerable 
to breathing poisonous air, to suffering in her short life, and to premature death. Research carried out in 2017 showed that black British and other racialized groups, other than Asian British, were more likely to be exposed to exceedances of the EU legal limit on air pollutants at the time. White and Asian British were the only racialized groups whose proportion of the total population of London was greater than the proportion of people exposed to exceedances of the legal limit. The maps that I'm going to show you were included in this 2017 study, and they're helpful in visualizing the variation in air pollution exposure for sections of the London population and correspondence with local deprivation. So this first map shows that there are relatively few geographical areas in London where both the proportion of the white population and deprivation are high. These areas are generally located, indicated in green on the map, are generally located in the outskirts of London where air quality limits are not exceeded. The gray area is where air pollution was above the legal limit in 2017. And the green area is the location of the 30% most deprived areas in London with the highest proportion of white people. In contrast, the research showed that for racialized groups, there was a higher concentration of areas where pollution exceeds the legal limit. This correlates most strongly to black, mixed, and other racialized groups. Again, the gray area shows where air pollution was above the legal limit, and the purple area is the location of the 30% most deprived areas in London with the highest proportion of black people. And if you look there where the Thames runs through, you'll see that on the second map, where Lewisham is marked, so you can see roughly where that would be on the previous map. This is where Ella Kissy Deborah live, an area in which air pollution exceeded the legal limit. This report has since been updated in 2019, um, and it confirms this variation in the distribution of both nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter, the most noxious substances um, in the air. Between 31 and 35% of areas with the highest proportion of black and mixed racialized groups coincide with the areas with higher levels of air pollution. And in comparison, the figures drop to 15 to 18% for areas with the majority of people from Asian groups and 4 to 5% for white groups. In 2021, a study was conducted by the Environmental Defense Fund Europe, and that found that nitrogen dioxide is 24 to 31% higher in areas of London where people from black, Asian, or minority backgrounds are most likely to live. Additionally, it found that the most deprived Londoners are more than six times more likely to live in areas with higher pollution than the least deprived. That same year, to coincide with the release of the report, the campaign organization Choked Up, a group of black and brown teenagers from South London, one of whom went to primary school with Ella Kissy Deborah, put up hacked road signs across London to highlight the disproportionate impact of toxic air on people of color. The signs read pollution zones and breathing kills. So the inquest system and the legal system more broadly has proved itself unable to identify state racism as a cause of death, even in the clearest cases. In relation to the public inquiry into the Grenfell Tower fire, which of course has just closed in terms of its, um, its hearing evidence, official documentation was provided in Arabic and Farsi, as well as in English. This is an indication of the racialization of the majority of the victims. Yet racial discrimination was not an issue under investigation. This is despite the fact that understanding the causes of the fire and preventing a similar atrocity happening again requires confronting the institutional racism faced by the residents of the tower. Although they had repeatedly demanded that their homes be made safe before the fire, they were ignored and treated as being undeserving of living in North Kensington. In 2014, three former G4S officers were acquitted of the manslaughter of Jimmy Mubenga. Evidence that the trial judge ordered be withheld from the jury including that, that included that which related to racist text messages found on the phones of two of the guards who restrained Mubenga. 
Until now, no officer has been held criminally responsible for the death of Christopher Alder, who choked to death in Hull Police Station after being restrained by police officers in 1998. He was left on the floor with a pool of blood forming around his mouth. CCTV audio later showed that officers had been making monkey noises while Alder lay dying. Shireen Razak has written about how inquests into custodial deaths of racialized people are places where we encounter stories of addiction, alcoholism, and dysfunction, rather than an interrogation of the violence committed by state actors. The legal system is uninterested in the causes of death that lie beyond the immediate. As Razak writes, inquests are structured to have little time for the past. In colonial contexts such as Canada and Britain, where colonial legacies of racism mean that personhood is daily denied, racial state violence becomes the work of the state. And this violence, in turn, is illegible to the legal system. For Ella, simply breathing was a struggle. She died after an asthma attack, but she couldn't breathe because she lived, in the words of Christina Sharp, in the wake of the violence of colonialism and slavery. While Ella's breath mattered to the individual health profession, professionals with whom she regularly came into contact, the reasons for her difficulty breathing can't come to the surface in a context in which Britain's colonial history and its legacies are deemed irrelevant. Shireen Razak has described legal processes as being in the first instance pedagogical. What does the inquest system teach us? That victims of racial state violence have died of natural causes whether excited delirium, a medical condition conveniently invented to explain apparently unprovoked custodial deaths, or, in the case of Ella Kissy Deborah, an asthma attack. In view of this, it is to somewhere other than the legal system that we have to look to learn about the intersections between race, class, and air pollution. For Judith Butler, we make a mistake if we take the def definitions of who we are legally to be adequate descriptions of what we are about. Butler encourages us to do justice to passion and grief and rage, all of which tear us from ourselves, bind us to others, transport us, undo us, implicate us in lives that are not our own, irreversibly, if not fatally. In my work on custodial deaths, I try to pay attention to justice, passion, grief, and rage by centering understandings of love, grief, and solidarity in family struggles for justice. I try to identify moments and modes of anti-racist and anti-colonial resistance to racial state violence, which occur outside the legal system. For example, the United Families and Friends campaign is a coalition of those affected by deaths in police, prison, and psychiatric custody. Marcia Rigg, whose brother Sean Rigg died in Brixton Police Station in August 2008, describes the purpose of the collective as being to support families so that they can meet other families and share their stories, their pain, and have somebody else to talk to that understands what they've been through. UFFC and its gathering of families across Britain affected by custodial deaths focuses our attention on the prevalence of racial state violence which is otherwise misconstrued as being exceptional. The organization works to allow for collective expressions of grief and memorialization that embody a defiance of the state's treatment of black deaths as ungrievable. UFFC organizes an annual memorial procession in remembrance of those who've died in custody. Marcia Rigg describes the occasion as one where families can give an account of their pain and tell their stories. The procession is powerful because it marks, in Butler's words, relations that cannot be honored, cannot be publicly grieved, and that involve persons who are also restricted in the very act of grieving, who are denied the power to confer legitimacy on loss. These bold public expressions of grief are at the same time demands for truth, justice, and accountability. So perhaps one way to start thinking about mobilizing against climate catastrophe and its racialized effects in productive ways, which tear us from ourselves and bind us to others, in modes that show solidarity and recognize privilege, is to look to some of the actions that embody this. For example, that of the Stansted 15. 
In March 2017, activists stopped a chartered deportation flight to Nigeria and Ghana from taking off. Although the immediate political demand of the activists was to end deportations, the action drew attention to how risks are differentially allocated in a world still colonially structured. While air travel is predominantly a privilege of white people, it is used as a means of racial exclusion in the form of deportation. Poor racialized people denied visas have to make dangerous and often fatal journeys across desert seas to f across deserts and seas to find safety. Meanwhile, air travel's harmful byproducts, air pollution, and climate disaster disproportionately impact the racialized poor, exacerbating conditions that are colonial legacies of displacement, poor health, and vulnerability to premature death. In recent years, we have seen how the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected racialized populations. The so-called underlying conditions that mean racialized people are more likely to die from COVID-19 and the pre are the pre-existing structural conditions that actually make them vulnerable, most vulnerable to all risks, not just that of the virus. A UK government report confirmed that the pandemic has reproduced existing health inequalities. It showed that the risk of dying of the virus was higher among people in more deprived areas and higher still among black, Asian, and minority racialized people living in these areas. Members of the Bangladeshi population were overall twice as likely to die of the virus as white people. There was a particularly high increase in deaths from all causes during the pandemic among people born outside the UK, as well as among nursing and care workers, transport and security staff, and people working in construction and processing plants. Black, Asian, and minority racialized people died disproportionately in these sectors. And here I want to borrow from Sahay Mamanzo Khan's extraordinary poem, Breathlessness is Not a Momentary Condition, where she writes, Breathlessness is not a momentary condition. We could have told you that an airway is not obstructed merely from the moment it is physically blocked. It begins when you are expected to breathe in a world which denies you access to air. Finally, I want to mention the case of Alaa Abdel Fattah. Alaa is a human rights activist who has been a political prisoner in Egypt for most of the past decade. He was handed successive prison sentences for his political activity in the course of the 2011 Egyptian revolution, and most recently, a five-year sentence for sharing a Facebook post in protest at the death of a prisoner in solitary confinement in an Egyptian prison. Alaa has been on a partial hunger strike for over 200 days, taking only 100 calories a day. Two weeks ago, he began a full hunger strike, and a week ago, at the start of the UN's climate change conference, COP27, he went on a temporary water strike to draw attention to his plight and that of the 60,000 political prisoners in Egypt. His aunt, the novelist Ahdaf Suif, said of her nephew, Alaa cannot live as a passive thing, as someone to whom things are just done to. He has tried over this whole ordeal to be active and to be effective. His book, You Have Not Yet Been Defeated, is articles, a lot of which were written in prison and smuggled out. In all sorts of ways, he has continued to be an active and effective member of the community. And now, the only way that's left to him to be active is by using his body, by going on hunger strike, and now on water strike. Alat's protest is a terrible reminder of the connection between the climate catastrophe, social deprivation, and the violence of the carceral state. While Egypt hosts the UN's climate change conference, faking environmentalist credentials for the world, pretending the counter-revolutionary dictatorship allows space for civil society, the country's political activists, the people who truly care about the climate, languish in prisons. And those who dare to point out this hypocrisy face arrest and imprisonment. Ella Kissy Deborah couldn't breathe under the weight of centuries of colonial and racial violence. The same violence is embodied in the actions of the police officers who physically weighed down Eric Garner and the G4S guards who restrained Jimmy Mubenga, making it impossible for them to breathe. It's difficult not to feel rage when thinking about these lives cut short. Grief studies have shown that in cases of preventable deaths, especially those caused by racism, grief is particularly intense and includes feelings of anger and rage. <laughs> 
Listen to how James Baldwin's character, Ida, a black woman living in New York in the 1950s, whose brother Rufus dies after throwing himself from a bridge, describes her grief to Rufus's white friend, Vivaldo. Wouldn't you hate all white people if they kept you in prison here, kept you here, and stunted you, and starved you, and made you watch your mother, and father, and sister, and lover, and brother, and son, and daughter die, or go mad, or go under, before your very eyes, and not in a hurry, like from one day to the next, but every day, for years, for generations. Shit, they keep you here because you're black, while they go around jerking themselves off with all the jazz about the land of the free and the home of the brave. Ida captures the weight of centuries of oppression, the slow, protracted way of colonial violence. I try to acknowledge this rage and look to its expressions as a mode of anti-colonial resistance. These expressions need not be orderly, nor quiet, nor legal. They can be riotous, discordant, and sometimes seem to fail. For Gabriela Jimenez, systemic injustice requires listening to and for the elsewhere in the voices performing decolonial efforts in the course of resistance movements. She writes that shouting or chanting is another way of breathing elsewhere into existence. This is, of course, not to say that we shouldn't seek to rely on the law for progressive ends and protect it as an avenue for justice for the marginalized. We must, just as Rosamond Kissy Deborah and the families of death and custody victims are doing. But we must also keep in mind that the law renders racialized victims non-entities insofar as it cannot account for what makes them acutely vulnerable to harm and premature death, fatal forces of which it is one. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you um, so much. Do you want me to yeah, come there? Yeah, have a seat and we'll take some questions. Yeah. I mean, that, it was incredibly powerful the way you um, put these day-to-day -day environmental issues into this broader context of injustice. Um, wonderful, thank you. Um, we have some time for questions. Very brief. Um, I watched for the last few years all the stuff about racism and the colonialism. The colonialism, uh, I've been warning people about for the last few years, is the green colonialism. So I've mentioned this universities and yesterday on places for the last few years saying what about the green colonialism which is forcing upon the global south to mine up their resources for the green solutions for the lithium that come off to the bauxite for the electric cars with turbine and solar panels and every time I point that out as yesterday where the panel most of the panels are white they've ridiculed me they mocked it and they said, this is, a, this is nothing to worry about. We need the resources. So my question is, is that when the shoe is on the other foot, is the climate change movement prepared to accept the racism that sits within their own ranks, where the racism is institutional? Just like the Met Police said in the 90s after Stephen Longer's report, they said, we've got institutional racism within our own ranks. So people say to me, we need the resources. I says, yeah, but you still strip mine a forest for your green solution. So my question is to that, that how is that going to be? Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going gonna... to gonna... rehearse questions for, for the benefit of the people online. Um, so, and I'm really sorry to hear you mocked for raising that actually perfectly pertinent and important question. The question is essentially about green colonialism, and I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Nadine to respond. Yeah, I mean, I, I think your point is, is correct, is well taken, and I think is also shown um, in this sort of, um, in this kind of trajectory that I was trying to draw, or the, or the dots I was trying to connect between colonialism, its ongoing legacies, and then the destruction of people's lives and health that you see today, that can be mapped globally in exactly the way that you describe, in green colonialism and the continued extraction of labor, of wealth, of resources, of land, 
continues in every respect, um, not just for the purposes of um, extracting resources that will then be used for progressive green ends um, in, in the north, um, but also for the same old, um, you know, non-green uh, capitalist ends of racial capitalist ends of the North. Um, that hasn't changed. And of course, that's a separate question to the one of whether the climate movement is willing to accept the racism that lies within their own, within their own acts. I think that if we are to address colonialism and racism domestically, but also globally, it has to. It has to. But we've seen so many issues with that, as, as you will be well aware, more aware than I, than I am, I'm sure, in relation to Extinction Rebellion and the kind of cooperation or collusion with the police and the, and the inability to read what's happening with that, with that um, when those kinds of, um, uh, when that kind of cooperation is unthinkingly um, carried out without thinking, well, hang on a second, think about deaths in custody, think about who... Um, who was particularly vulnerable to police brutality on the streets to stop and search. You know, a failure to connect those dots and to see that institutional racism affects all institutions and all movements, all social movements, so all institutions, like this university, all universities. So what's the solution? Is it going to be a case of, if we recognise the resources are being stolen from indigenous lands, then are people going to be prepared to tell my friend in Congo that, you know what, we have to do with that these resources, which means you get to keep your forests. I mean, of course. I mean, in the sense that there's going to be, have to be a massive acceptance by a lot of people no. that they need to surrender wealth or to surrender some of the things that we've come to rely on and depend on and see ourselves as entitled to be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I can't tell you how many people will be prepared to do that. And I think things are going to get a lot worse before we get close to that, if we ever get close to that. I, I'm not going to give you a solution. I'm not even going to... No, I'm not saying that. I, I just mean because I don't have it, and I also don't have much hope. I'm not going to lie about that either. But I think that all we can do is point this stuff out. And I think what you did to raise that, that panel, I don't know which event you're talking about, but I think to raise it is crucial to insist that that point be made and to insist that people are made to feel uncomfortable in hearing that argument. And I think it's all that we can do. Let, let, let's, let's see if we have any more questions, but thank, thank you so much for that question. Um, yes, please. Um, hi, um, thank you so much for your talk. It's really, really insightful. Um, I'm a political ecologist, and I'm really interested in looking at the emotions and how they create geographies of action. Um, and I really loved your insights on rage and how important that is um, for expression for marginalized people within the asymmetrical complex. Um, and I was wondering what you think about like kind of balancing rage and grief with action, what, what have you found has been helpful or unhelpful in these kind of situations? Mm -hmm. So I think, I suppose what I was trying to say is that rage needs to be recognized as um, not just a, a, a legitimate response, um, actually a reasonable response to the kind of Violence that we are faced with, even if we're not indirect, even if we're not directly affected, um, but just getting the the news um, of, of of this kind of 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 this kind of patterns of violence that we see, um, that we need to recognise that as a reasonable response, but then also to see how families who have suffered the loss of a loved one in a context of racial state violence, and obviously the families that I've spoken to predominantly up until this point are families of victims of death in custody, um, of death in custody. For, for them, rage has been channeled into action. I mean, it, they're, not, they're not two separate things. I mean, the action has come in terms of fighting the legal battle, so exhausting the legal route, but also taking to the streets, connecting with people who've experienced um, have had similar experiences, but also connecting the dots between things like Grenfell and deaths in custody, Black Lives Matter and Grenfell. You know, the, all of these, these patterns of violence, whether they're slow or sudden, are all connected to these legacies of colonialism and violence. And we can see the same yesterday with the story that came out of the 
the two-year-old boy who died because of mold exposure in his home. I mean, that is directly connected to Grenfell. I mean, he said, I mean, the, the coroner said that this should be, I can't remember the exact words that we used, I, I meant to look at it, but something like a galvanizing moment for the housing sector. But, you know, how was that not Grenfell? How was that not the galvanizing moment? Um, of course, it's because of the failure to connect the two. Um, and it's crucial that they are, because of course his family had appealed for help since 2017, raising the question of the mold. Nothing was done about it. And in the end, this child died. And you know, part of the reason was because they weren't taken seriously as social housing residents. Um, his family is a Sudanese family, a black family. Um, English was um, a, a, a communication and, and spoken English was an issue. There were issues, none of this was taken seriously. They was just dismissed and ignored until it was too late. And it's exactly the same story. I mean, the same reports were made about, from the Grenville families. And I think Sorry, drawing, okay. these, drawing these links that's so powerful, isn't it, in the work you're doing, so areas that don't seem closely connected yeah. at first, at first glance. Did you yeah. want to just, yeah. Sorry. just really quickly, because we've got a few others, yeah. Embodiment of the actual Absolutely. Okay, yeah. Thing, yeah. And I think rage, rage, the, rage in particular, if, if your loved one has been taken in a circumstance that is preventable, that could have been prevented, imagine the rage, the powerlessness, the, the sense that this didn't have to happen. I mean, grief is so much more accentuated if you can't make any kind of peace or acceptance because you know that this didn't have to happen to your loved one. I thank you. Um, I've got a couple more, and I, I'm also going to interject something at this point, and then we'll take them. Sure. And you can you as can you respond like. as you wish. Mm -hmm. I, I I really loved the moment when you said that the, the racism is not legible to the law, um, and I wonder whether you think there are ways, and they might be small ways and quite banal ways, but whether there are ways in in which the racism can be made legible to law. So that, that was one of my thoughts. We have a question here. I'm curious about the two graphs with the grey mm -hmm. area showing the uh, illegally high levels of nitrogen dioxide, and then you can see that the uh, green areas were outside of the grey area, and there was more overlap with the pink areas and the yeah. grey area, or vice versa. Yeah. Um, within that grey area, there's some incredibly affluent areas like Mayfair, and that's also within the area that had unla unlawfully high levels of nitrogen dioxide. Is everyone living within a grey area affected equally by that air, or is, are there discre mm -hmm. discrepancies within it, and why is that? Um, so the... Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. yeah. Sure. No, no, you go on. No, that's, no, 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 that's fine. Uh, yeah. Take, take yours, Stephen. Thanks, Maria, and thank you for such a I mean, both painful and powerful talk. Um, it was actually what you said, Maria, and I guess I'd like to hear more from you if you speak to it about um, law as a kind of do you have any hope for law as a vehicle of possibility here or not? And I got the sense from your talk, perhaps not, but I think it connects to mm. how Maria framed her question to you as well. Mm. Thank you. So if you go for those, and we'll yeah, have one sure. final round and then... Sorry, so I'll just, because those two link, I'll just... Mm. So um, so I haven't dug into the into the, the discrepancy you're talking about. Um, the data, as I understood it, was looking at deprivation together with location. And I mean, it even within those locations, it can differ to how closely you live, for example, to a high emission road and, and whether you live on a quiet tree-lined street. So even the presence, for example, of trees on a street will make a difference to, um, the, to, to, to the penetration of air pollution um, compared to if you live on a, a completely urbanized street and very close. So I imagine a lot of that will, will, um, will play in We'll play into that. I had another point. I thought this was going to happen with the three questions. Um, uh, yes, but I think but I think the data in that sense is it was somewhat limited by the data because it was looking particularly at um, the intersection between deprivation and location. But as you say, the map, you know, is central London and will demonstrate affluent areas too. I mean, in the case of very affluent areas, often they're not residential areas, but are affluent areas, but without without necessarily people living there. Um, but I think it's a really interesting question that I'll definitely be looking into in more detail. Yeah. Thank you. And the two laws. Yeah, sorry. So, um, yeah. So, can race be legible to the law? I mean, it's a bit of a dif different question to that to to the, to the second question, isn't it? Did you mean more sort of in terms of um, 
moments in which that legibility might be witnessed, but not in a sort of, oh, here's a judgment that is in your favour that recognises it? Or I, I did wonder, you mean I, I tend to think a more subtle... When, when, we, when we look at problems like this as lawyers, we're, we're, everyone's hoping for some big dramatic mm -hmm. case yeah. or something exciting. And much more often you render things legible through little, boring, day-to-day yeah. -day legal changes yeah. or legal approaches and I just I just wondered if you could imagine ways of making law legible and then I think Stephen's point is yeah. more about whether you have any hope for law. Um, yeah I mean so I mean if I think for instance of the the death and custody cases um, that I've looked at each in each case the legal avenues are exhausted and there is no judgment or any sort of um, something that I would say would be a material kind of legibility in the way that you're talking about. However, if we think of the Grenfell Tower inquiry, for, for example, um, when the Black Lives Matter protests happened, the Grenfell Tower, the Grenfell United did an action. I don't know if some of you recall, they projected onto Grenfell Tower fire, I think it was the summer of 2020 when the Black Lives Matter demonstrations happened, saying we, we couldn't breathe either. So they were making the connection between Black Lives Matter and the I can't breathe, um, uh, tagline of those protests with what happened to their loved ones. And then the next day, um, the QC for some of the families mentioned the importance of race and class and how that, you know, made it made in his opening statement when the, the, um, the inquiry was reopening after a COVID pause, kind of made this very strong statement around race. And I, that was that was a direct result of what was happening on the ground. So it wasn't the work of you know, the lawyers or the legal system, it was the, the work of the families in enforcing that into that space. You know, ultimately, of course, as we've seen with the closure of the, of the inquiry, it's denial, 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 deflection of responsibility. We'll see in a year's time when the report is produced what it's going to say in terms of any kind of responsibility. But in terms of the formal terms of reference, race doesn't feature. But what I, there were moments, I think, in, some of these processes, like for example, I attended a police disciplinary hearing with a family of a loved one who'd been killed by the police in psychiatric custody, and they had no right to speak in that space, um, because of course it was the police officer was facing a disciplinary hearing, so the family, and I was with them, were sitting at the back, totally silent throughout. And all you heard, of course, from were the lawyers and for the, for the officers, and, and from the officer themselves, and from the chair, and then of course the, um, the lawyers on the other side. But then right at the end, to our surprise, the chair said to the family, would anybody from the family like to speak? And that completely took us by surprise. It really took by surprise the, um, King, it was Kingsley Burrell's, um, uh, uh, the case of Kingsley Burrell. His, his mother was so surprised, but it felt for her like a kind of recognition. It was so minor and it was nothing. But I did feel in that moment something has entered this room in a way that it wouldn't have if he hadn't said that. Yeah. And it was nothing. But I also, it was something. And I can't say it wasn't something because it felt like something to them. Yeah. It felt like something to us. So I suppose I would say there, there are moments of beauty in these horrific in mm. contexts of injustice that do arise. Um, what I have hope for the law. Um, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I think it's so necessary to defend. I actually have one more slide that I could just show on that. So this is um, Mary Matsuda, who is um, a critical race feminist. Um, and she says, there are times to stand outside the courtroom door and say this procedure is a farce. The legal system is corrupt. Justice will never prevail in this land as long as privilege rules in the courtroom. There are times to stand in the courtroom and say, this is a nation of laws, laws recognizing fundamental values of rights, equality, and personhood. Sometimes, as Angela Davis did, there is a need to make both speeches in one day. So I think, and, and I really stand by this, you know, we're in a situation where, you know, the Human Rights Act is under threat. <laughs> um, I would do anything to defend the Human Rights Act and its importance. Um, you know, I think that should be like the key campaign because it is the last bastion of hope for the most vulnerable in society. That, that's, that's the reality of that situation. So even though I'm very critical of the law, um, it's because the evidence for 
gaining a legal judgment or justice of the kind that we want in, in the cases that I'm talking about is so, it has never happened. So there has to be work done in looking for other avenues. But I think that the families of these campaigns understand better than anyone else that justice is not just about the law because all of them, all of them have reached the end of the line in terms of what the law can offer them. But if you ask them what they're doing, they will say they are fighting for justice and they will go on fighting for justice until they take their last breath. Because of course, they're in a situation where a loved one has died in entirely preventable circumstances where the state is implicated. And so they feel that anger and that rage and need to fight. And they're still fighting for justice, even though their legal cases are completely defeated. But they don't see it that way. And I think that they're right. I think that they know that justice is not about the system delivering something is not designed to deliver. It's never going to do that because it is precisely designed to reproduce the very same inequality so, so that the status quo remains. It's not for that. It's not for delivering justice in these cases. Um, and they know that, but they don't go on, they don't stop fighting because I think that their, their envisioning of justice is something beyond the status quo of this world. It is not what we have now, it's something else. Um, I think they can see that, and so I've learned a lot about justice and about what it means and what we can think of it as meaning beyond the law, whilst also saying we absolutely have to defend it, like Rosamund Kissy Deborah fighting for air pollution on her daughter's air certificate is crucial because of the awareness that it draws to the problem, and then it's for us to add all this other analysis and draw attention to the, more, the less visible structures of violence that produce this kind of harm. That was wonderful. Oh, I'll just take one more, one more. <laughs> hey, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for your talk. It was really, really interesting. Um, obviously, I sit here as like a white woman. Um, I, I found all the kind of racial, colonial aspects to your talk extremely interesting and eye-opening as someone who doesn't, isn't <laughs> someone who experiences that. The reason why I came here today was because I myself I'm very passionate about air pollution. I'm mm -hmm. someone who is affected by the levels of the poor levels of air quality in London, and I wear a pollution mask mm -hmm. everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. And in in the time that I've been experiencing that, I've come across um, Ella's case, um, and it made me realise how privileged I am that I am able to choose where I live, and mm -hmm. I am able to pay for quite expensive pollution masks to, and choose where to live. I can move away if I want to. Yeah. So I just wanted to share that just because it's a very yeah. personal thing for me and um, yeah, I think it's great that you're covering it. But the question that I really have is, well, kind of twofold, is firstly what inspired you to kind of look at air pollution and Ella's case in your research? And secondly, what can we do, you know, kind of spoke about how people are fighting for justice. What, what can normal people do to help fight for what you're talking about in every aspect, but also in terms of the fight for clean air as well. Yeah. Um, so on the first question, I mean, when I first read the news about Ella's death, it was years ago. It was before the second inquest, probably after the ruling about the first inquest or the maybe when the new evidence had come out in terms of the um, pollution potentially being related to her death. But I first saw that news report, and honestly, I just saw Ella's picture and learned she was a nine-year-old girl who died pr probably due to air pollution. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't handle that as being a reality of this world. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't respond to that in any other way than, than think that can't happen ever again. Of course, it's ridiculous because it's happening all over the world all the time. But that was just really my response. But, and so it was in my mind. And then because of the other work that I've been doing on deaths in custody and then Grenfell, I could see how, you know, when, when Grenfell Tower Fire happened, the horror of the scene drew all this emergency response to it, physically an emergency response to it. But the warnings had been building for, for years, for a decade. The residents had been saying, we need help to make this place safe. And it was that sense that nobody could see. It was like this invisible thing, but it was obvious to the people suffering it. And as Ella's case is the same. There's this slowness to that violence, that invisibility. And what I suppose what I was trying to say 
is we need to raise the alarm before it's the violent spectacle. But then, of course, even when it's the violent spectacle, like Grenfell, like deaths in custody, you have it on camera, mm. what's happening to people. The law still says, oh, well, you know, died of an asthma attack, died of um, excited delirium, rather than find guilty those who are responsible. And, and, and you know, so it was, it was investigating that. It was kind of saying that, you know, Ella's case is connected to Grenfell. Grenfell is connected to, to, to what's happening in relation to deaths in custody. Deaths in custody connected to what's happening in, to what happened in 1971 and 1981 with, with the closure of the borders to racialized people. And then internally you had that questioning of the right of people to be here. It's what the Grenfell residents experienced. It's what the parents of the little boy who died and th that I just talked about in relation to the coroner's report that came out yesterday. It's the same with Ella. Nobody bothered to look into what was killing this child. Um, so it was just about drawing those dots. And I think in terms of what people can do to campaign, there are so many, cam I mean, I'm not the person to, I guess, answer that question well. I mean, there are so many campaign organizations um, that are raising awareness and getting treated horrifically for it. Um, you know, I worry about climate protesters. I, I worry about what's going to happen to them because of just how harshly the law is coming down on them, but also the kind of vigilante violence they're subjected to by people who just want to drive somewhere and so will literally pull people out of the road and throw them across. I mean, you know, honestly, it terrifies me. I, I think... Should I stop there? Do you want me to stop? <laughs> I'll stop. That, that, that was wonderful. It's a great moment to stop. It's a slightly dispiriting moment Sorry, to stop. Sorry, I always, always end on a dispiriting moment. At the end of an incredibly inspiring... Um, uh, and it's incredibly inspiring lecture, actually, making those connections in a really powerful way. Um, and, you know, we, we, there, there is hope in, in feeling that we can make those connections and that we can yeah. begin to take small steps to Thank you. Uh, make it things better. <laughs> yes. And um, we're really grateful to you, Nadine. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.